When parenteral nutrition is initiated, it's typically provided as a 24-hour infusion. While this is convenient when a patient is hospitalized, it becomes a barrier to patients who require a long-term infusion at home. As a result, these patients are often transitioned to cyclic parenteral nutrition. This typically runs for 8 to 18 hours per day, and most of the time it's given at night when the patient is sleeping. The objectives of this video are to cover the potential advantages of cyclic parenteral nutrition, highlight potential concerns with cyclic parenteral nutrition, and discuss how we can address those concerns. The primary advantage of a cyclic infusion is that it promotes quality of life. As I've already mentioned, a continuous infusion can become a barrier to patients who require a long-term infusion. This is because it forces them to be hooked up to a mechanical feeding pump all day and all night. A cyclic infusion allows them to be free from the pump for much of the day, making it easier to participate in daytime activities like traveling to and from school or work, shopping and exercising, and socializing. Simply put, cyclic parenteral nutrition helps to restore at least some sense of normalcy to their daily routine. In addition to this, a cyclic infusion may have some metabolic advantages. For one, it can play a role in the prevention and treatment of steatosis. Steatosis is characterized by the accumulation of fat in the liver. It's one form of parenteral nutrition-associated liver disease, alongside cholestasis and gallbladder sludge or stones. It's usually benign, but over time, it can progress to fibrosis or cirrhosis. Early signs include elevated serum aminotransferase levels, alkaline phosphatase, and total bilirubin. Although steatosis occurs most often in the setting of overfeeding, it sometimes happens with no known cause. One hypothesis is that the continuous infusion of nutrients leads to excessive insulin secretion, and this promotes fat deposition in the liver. Therefore, by switching to a cyclic infusion of nutrients, the body can get relief from the secretion of insulin, and this allows for clearance of fat from the liver. Perhaps unsurprisingly, few studies have actually explored cyclic parenteral nutrition as an intervention for steatosis. Most recently, a retrospective observational study asked what is the effect of switching from a continuous infusion to a 12-hour cyclic infusion for patients who presented with signs of liver dysfunction. The change was made for a total of 37 patients, and it resulted in a significant reduction in ALT, AST, and total bilirubin, but not alkaline phosphatase. The authors concluded that the administration of cyclic parenteral nutrition is effective in reverting parenteral nutrition-associated liver dysfunction. In terms of randomized controlled trials, I've only seen one cited in the literature on this topic. It showed that switching patients to a 12-hour cyclic infusion stabilized their total bilirubin, whereas keeping them on a continuous infusion led to further increases. This advantage was only seen with a baseline measurement between 5 and 20 mg per deciliter, and not in patients with a baseline measurement greater than 20. Unfortunately, I've only been able to gather details on this trial from the abstract and a review paper that discusses it. I can't locate the full text anywhere online, which is quite unusual for me. Overall, switching to cyclic parenteral nutrition to assist in the prevention and treatment of steatosis appears to be a worthwhile endeavor since it may be beneficial and offers little risk. Nevertheless, treatment should only be considered alongside an investigation of the total energy load because steatosis often indicates that the patient is being overfed. Another possible advantage of cyclic parenteral nutrition is in the prevention and treatment of essential fatty acid deficiency. This, of course, would only apply to patients who are at risk of deficiency due to the need for a fat-free or very low-fat admixture. 
Scenarios that contribute to this need include a national shortage of supplies, which is not uncommon, and when there's concern for an allergic reaction. Most of the intravenous fat emulsions in the United States contain soy and egg. Even though allergic reaction to a fat emulsion is rare, there have been case reports of it happening, so sometimes they are withheld in patients with a known history of anaphylaxis. With fat-free parenteral nutrition, essential fatty acid deficiency can develop in as quickly as two weeks, yet the amount of time it takes varies from patient to patient and is quite unpredictable. A continuous infusion is believed to be undesirable to prevent or treat it. This is because the continuous secretion of insulin limits the mobilization of essential fatty acids stored in adipose tissue. By cycling the parenteral nutrition, the patient gets some relief from insulin, the stored essential fatty acids get released, and deficiency can be delayed or reversed. Similar to the treatment of steatosis, the use of a cyclic infusion to prevent essential fatty acid deficiency isn't supported by a large body of evidence. The only study I was able to uncover is from 1979. In this study, Maschioli et al. provided a continuous, fat-free parenteral nutrition to seven patients. They were able to induce essential fatty acid deficiency in five of seven of them in six weeks or less. They tried treating the deficiency by switching to a cyclic infusion in just one patient, and it worked within one week. In the end, this intervention falls right next to the prevention and treatment of steatosis. There's potential for benefit, and it carries little risk. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. You can also join me on Instagram at Mitchell Zandis, where I post reels and host weekly Q&A sessions. Now that we've covered the potential advantages, we're going to turn to the potential concerns. Historically, the major concern with cyclic parenteral nutrition has been with glycemic control. More specifically, glycemic control in the context of an abrupt initiation and discontinuation of an IV dextrose solution. Clinicians worried that an abrupt initiation of a significant dextrose load would lead to hyperglycemia, and that an abrupt discontinuation of the dextrose load would lead to rebound hypoglycemia. This led many to taper up the infusion rate at the beginning of the session, and taper it down at the end of it. For instance, if you have a 14-hour infusion, you would start with a 1-hour taper rate, followed by a 12-hour maintenance rate, and then return to the taper rate for the final hour. The taper rate is often 50% of the maintenance rate. Even though some clinicians and hospitals follow this protocol out of an abundance of caution, several studies have shown that the abrupt initiation and discontinuation of cyclic parenteral nutrition doesn't result in hyperglycemia or symptomatic hypoglycemia in adults. In other words, it appears that starting and finishing adults at the goal rate is safe. As a general practice, it's still a good idea to obtain a point-of-care glucose measurement one hour after stopping the infusion, especially if you're working on a case where glycemic control has been an issue. You should also monitor for classic symptoms of hypoglycemia, like weakness, lethargy, and sweating. Beyond glycemic control, the only other concern I've seen mentioned in the literature is critical illness. This concern is based off a trial by Forsberg et al. It showed that in mechanically ventilated and traumatized and infected ICU patients, use of continuous parenteral nutrition resulted in more efficient fuel utilization than with cyclic parenteral nutrition. This study reinforces that cyclic parenteral nutrition is best suited for stable patients who require a long-term infusion. Before we finish, I want to teach you a little bit more about tapering cyclic parenteral nutrition. 
As we just saw in the section on glycemic control, doing this isn't necessary for all patients, but it's something to consider when 1. You feel it's best for your patient, like a case where you've had issues with glycemic control, or 2. You work for a hospital or company that requires it as a policy. Once a decision to taper has been made, the first step is to determine the maintenance rate. You do this by taking the total volume and dividing it by the desired infusion time in hours minus 1. After that, you determine the taper rate by taking the maintenance rate and dividing it by 2. Then to finish it off, you write the prescription. As an example, let's pretend you're doing a 14 hour infusion. You start at the taper rate for 1 hour, then infuse at the maintenance rate for 12 hours, then you finish with the taper rate for 1 hour. So, if you have an admixture of 1800 milliliters and want to provide it for 14 hours per day, you would do 1800 divided by 14 minus 1. The maintenance rate is approximately 140 milliliters per hour. Then you take 140 and divide it by 2, and that gives you the taper rate of 70 milliliters per hour. Now that you have the rates, you can write the prescription. You taper up at 70 milliliters per hour for 1 hour, maintain at 140 milliliters per hour for 12 hours, and then taper down at 70 milliliters per hour for 1 hour before the patient is disconnected. Last but not least, you can check your work by adding all of the milliliters together. Here, the total comes out to 1820 milliliters, and that's because I rounded up to the nearest whole number with the maintenance rate. It doesn't have to be perfect. All it means is the admixture will finish a few minutes sooner than expected. You can work with decimals if you want to, but I prefer to work with whole numbers because they're easier to communicate to others. Thank you for watching. You can check out all my other videos on parenteral nutrition by clicking the image on your screen.